think we're going to go ahead and get started. Hey everyone. Um, you don't know me. My name is Molly Callanan. I'm the student ABA rep here at Tulane. I'm really excited that everyone is here and I want to thank everyone for showing up and thank all of our distinguished panel members for donating their time and coming to speak with us today. And just take a minute to remind everyone that the uh, ABA criminal justice section is the most active and diverse criminal justice organization in the country. Judges, private organizations, attorneys, academics, students are all members of the section and there are more than 20,000 section members uh, which makes it uniquely situated to bring as we can see today various actors to come and speak with us. Uh, and if you guys don't know, membership to the section is free with your ABA membership. Student membership is $60 for three years or $25 a year. And it really is an invaluable resource to network and meet people and be able to uh, engage in panels and opportunities like this one. Uh, other benefits include uh, internship and network opportunities, uh, writing and mock trial competitions, which I really urge all of you to consider and to take advantage of. They really are an underutilized uh, benefit of ABA membership. Uh, there are over 30 committees, and we have special access to section events and periodicals. Uh, there are briefs of Supreme Court criminal law cases and discounts on CLE programs such as this one. Um, if you're not already a member of the ABA and the criminal justice section, you would like to be, come see me, or there are uh, membership applications outside, and I will be happy to answer anyone's questions and talk to anyone about the benefits of membership. Also, uh, there's a circulation, there's a, sorry, there's a sign-in circulating. If you guys could sign in and just let us know who came and who's interested, that would be great. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sidney Butcher, and I'm a prosecutor in Baltimore City. Um, my role with the ABA Criminal Justice Section is that I'm co-chair of membership along with Judy Friedman, uh, who's in the back, Judy Wade. And uh, our goal today is to give you more food at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll be coming soon. We have uh, some pizza and some drinks. But the more important goal is to try to provide an opportunity for you to hear from practitioners in the criminal justice field about what they do on a day-to-day -day basis and how they got there. And so with that, I'm going to start on my right, your left, and I'd like each of our esteemed panelists to take about 30 seconds to introduce them, just give a brief introduction, where you're working, what you do, all that good stuff. So Wayne? Uh, my name is Wayne McKenzie, and I'm general counsel at the New York City Department of Probation. And as I was explaining to some of my former, I mean my panelists here, I'm a former prosecutor uh, in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and I'm the current chair of the Racial and Ethnic Justice and Diversity Committee for uh, the Criminal Justice Section. My name is Lance Afric. I'm a United States District Court Judge in the Eastern District of Louisiana. I've been in that capacity for about 10 years. Before that, I was a U.S. Magistrate Judge for 12 years. Before that, I was at the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, where I was Chief of the Criminal Division for about nine years. And before that, I was a State Prosecutor in the Career Criminal Bureau for only these past about three years. And uh, before that, I was a private practice and I clerked, having graduated from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. Yay! <laughs> Go Heels! Love that. Go Heels! <laughs> Um, my name's Robin Schulberg. I'm an assistant federal public defender here in New Orleans. I do appeals, post-conviction habeas, and anything else that's kind of unusual. I kind of backed into this. I went to law school to be a civil rights lawyer and learned that you, you don't get paid. <laughs> but um, I found that criminal, criminal law is um, a great way to fight, an alternate way to fight the government. <laughs> My name is Amanda Downs Frizzell. I'm an assistant public defender, um, Maryland Office of the Public Defender. I handle exclusively appeals, criminal appeals. Prior to that, I was a trial attorney in the educational opportunities section of the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. Um, and 
prior to that, I was a, a, a trial PD um, in Annapolis, Maryland. Hi guys, uh, my name is Jim Letton. I'm the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Louisiana. That's the toe of the boot. Uh, we're three districts here in the state. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm a New Orleans native. I went to, uh, went to school here, went to uh, Catholic High School here, Dallas South High School, went to University of New Orleans, undergrad. Uh, graduated from Tulane Law School in, uh, in 1979. Uh, and thereafter spent about three years in the DA's office. Uh, and in fact, overlapped somewhat with uh, Judge Afric there. Um, where I tried cases, uh, probably had about 150 jury trials in about three years. Uh, went to the Organized Crime and Racketeering Strike Force, which was part of the Department of Justice Criminal Division in 82, uh, until that merged into the U.S. Attorney's Office, these, those strike force offices in, uh, in, in 1990. I was chief of that, became first assistant U.S. Attorney after that, then interim U.S. Attorney, then presidentially appointed U.S. Attorney, which, in which I've served continuously now for 11 years. I'm the senior sitting U.S. attorney in the country right now. Uh, thanks to our president and, and our, our Senator Mary Landry and Senator David Bitter as well. So uh, it's been a career along the way and now I'm uh, uh, appointed uh, official. My name is Jose Arojo and I'm the Chief Assistant State Attorney for the State's Attorney's Office in Miami, Florida. Uh, I've been a lawyer for about 24 years. I spent about 16 years of that time uh, at the state's attorney's office. I've left government practice a couple of times, and I represented uh, public sector labor unions, and uh, and also did some criminal defense work as a specially appointed uh, conflict uh, counsel uh, for indigent defendants in uh, in Florida. And uh, I did not go to school in Louisiana, but I did go to law school just down the street in Florida State. So, um, straight shooter I 10 if you if you ever care to visit. Happy to be here. Okay, uh, the goal with this panel is that I want uh, the information that's going to come out, I want you to see that everyone here is very active, not only with their careers, but also in the community. And then two, what the benefits of being an active member with the criminal justice section of the ABA, or any section for that matter, will allow you. Um, real quick, Jose, prior to being on this panel, what were you doing today? Um, at, uh, starting at 8 a.m. this morning, um, I was... Uh, I was uh, meeting with, and with the racial and uh, diversity, the racial, can help me out here, uh, Wayne? The <laughs> racial and ethnic diversity committee of the, uh, of the criminal justice section, which I work on um, with, uh, with, my, with my friend at the end there, with Wayne. And uh, we actually have kind of a traveling road show and uh, time and money uh, allowing, uh, we visit a lot of law schools and uh, we try to uh, generate interest amongst law students in the in the criminal justice field, both as defenders and as prosecutors, and in any other area. And uh, part part of the focus of that particular community of that particular committee is also to make sure that uh, minority law students, and I use that term expansively, um, understand that there's a role for you in the criminal justice field, um, both as defenders and as prosecutors. And uh, and hope uh, and hope to uh, have you all interested in. Uh, and visit with us, and if you're interested in jobs, we try to incorporate uh, recruitment and interviews along the way. I'm, I'm speaking to about a dozen students uh, here today from Tulane and from Loyola, and uh, some folks that joined out from LSU and Southern also. So that's uh, part of my outreach effort to, to get folks uh, interested and actually get you hired and pay you a terribly small sum to be a first state <laughs> prosecutor. Um, well, could you talk about what the role of a, of a new assistant district attorney in your office, what their day-to-day -day will look like? Sure. Um, I like to tell applicants that if you're interested in quiet, deliberate uh, work in a law office, if you're interested in working in, uh, in discovery um, uh, exhibits um, and uh, you, you, you want something very, very cerebral, that uh, you should not become a state prosecutor, definitely not become a state prosecutor in a large urban setting like Miami or like Brooklyn or or like, uh, or like Louisiana, for, or like uh, New Orleans for that matter. Um, you can expect after you go through our in-house training program, which is about six to eight weeks, and then we cut you loose in court, you can expect to, to spend the majority of your time, probably your first two to two and a half years in our office in court. Um, your, your desk will be someplace where you come for lunch and where you do paperwork in late afternoons and evening, but your real desk is going to be um, at the podium in the courtroom. You'll be in court every day, Monday through Friday, uh, pretty much from 9 a.m. in the morning until you know 12, 12 in the afternoon when you'll take your lunch and then you'll come back and you'll have motion practice 
Um, and, uh, and if you're going to try cases that week, you'll pick juries in the afternoon, and you'll be at court, you know, looking up at the looking up at the judge all day long, all week long for for a number of years. Um, it'll slow down a little bit as you become a more senior prosecutor, and the volume of your cases shortens, and you have more opportunity to work proactively on cases, particularly if you go into special prosecutions. Um, you will still have a significant amount of trial work, but as a new lawyer, um, you'll be in court all day long, Monday through Friday, um, and that's uh, that's what the, that's what you can expect, at least in our office, and I think in most large uh, prosecutors' office and defenders' offices across the country, your desk will be that podium, um, and uh, that's what you can expect. Amanda, you initially started off by talking about the fact that um, in your introduction that you were a trial attorney with the public defender's office. What was a typical day like for you as a trial attorney? Well, I think um, Jose summed it up nicely. I think it's the same for defenders and, and prosecutors in that way. Um, I remember I showed up um, the first day and walked into an office that <laughs> had 15 messages waiting and just stacks and stacks of files. And I was in court the, the very first day that I was there. So, um, you know, you, you just gotta, gotta roll with it. But, uh, after a while, you become very comfortable being in the courtroom, and I think that that experience in that high, high paced environment really, really helps me. Judge Afric, you talked, uh, you're, by, obviously you've handled a lot of cases, um, whether you were handling it yourself or you've heard them. What are some of the lessons that you would give to the, the law students that um, are hoping to be in the courtroom one day as, as litigators? Okay, well, just let me tell you one follow-up story, which, Amanda? Yes. Which, which you reminded me of. My first day on the job as a as a uh, U.S. magistrate judge, I primarily practiced in the criminal area, so a number of the civil lawyers didn't know me. When I got appointed by the district court to be U.S. magistrate judge, I had a pile of files and all these letters of people wanted status conferences and all that, because my name is spelled A-F-R-I-C-K, much like my son's, who's a first year law student here. And the salutation on the letter was, Dear Judge, a P R I C K. And I said, well, I've only been a fellow judge for a day, and already they called me a prick that could have <laughs> And actually, there was one district judge who really was one, so I put on the bottom of the <coughs> judge Arsene, which was related to me by mistake, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't sit too well. And one, one other story. The last time I was here to speak about criminal matters, Larry Ponderoff was the dean over here, and uh, I was speaking about some esoteric area of. Uh, in criminal criminal law, and uh, Larry came up to me and said, uh, you've got 15 minutes. And I said, Dean, how am I going to tell this group everything I know about this area of criminal law in 15 minutes? He says, well, Judge, you just have to speak very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what was your question? <laughs> What was your question? The question, the question is, uh, what tips would you have for uh, young litigators, um, whether they're prosecutors or, or public defenders? Um, what tips would you have them suggest to them that they, they take with them when they start their trial work? Okay, well, I don't know how federal court is in, uh, in your area, neck of the woods, or I know federal judges from all over the country, and sometimes they operate a little bit differently than the state court, and that's because we generally don't have the volume that the state courts have. So it allows us a little more latitude, more latitude as far as, I think, being prepared for what we're dealing with and time schedules and things like that. But as a young lawyer, the first thing you have to make sure of is whenever you walk into court, whether it be a state or federal court, you certainly have to be prepared. I can tell you, I can, I can suffer somebody who has an incorrect or, uh, uh, position or something which uh, position I'm not going to agree with. What I don't do well with is somebody who isn't prepared and somebody hasn't given me the respect of being ready to answer my questions because I can promise you that the federal judges here and all over the country are, are very ready to go ahead and deal with whatever issues are in front of them in the courtroom and outside the court. So that's the first thing. Second thing is because you have to work hard. Uh, you know, especially here in federal court, we have deadlines. Those deadlines mean something. So when you have, you, you're just not going to be able to come in and ask for a continuance last minute because you had other things going on. I can tell you that's not going to sell. Not going to sell with me and it's going to hurt your client. So you have to be aware of that. Another very important thing is uh, no matter what area of the law you go into, you need to treat your fellow lawyer with respect. I will tell you, we know the lawyers that cause problems, with, uh, that, that take personal shots at other lawyers, that don't treat other lawyers with respect, they don't act professionally, and those are not the lawyers who do well in front of us. It's a, you know, it's a, um, you can have a long career, and it's a tough career, it's a stressful career. Uh, I'm not saying you can't 
uh, represent your clients forcefully, you should, but you can you strike fair blows, you don't strike low ones. That's really it. And uh, you know, you have a world of opportunity as a lawyer to go ahead and not only do something good for your family and, 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 and help some people along the way, but act professionally and ethically and also do things in your community. And you're gonna do that in part because of your reputation and what people believe you to be. So um, I think that's a very important part of things. And uh, I have a law, a law clerk now who um, will be with me a year in June when she leaves me. I always hate to see my law clerks leave, especially this particular law clerk. But um, not only is she very bright, but I've told her, just like I've told a number of my other clerks, that you know when you get out there, when you graduate, uh, don't just take the appetizer, uh, eat the meal as well. Get involved with things like the ABA, like the local bar associations, like the state bar associations. It's a great networking thing for one thing. And you know, it, 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 just, it, it just gives you a bunch of opportunities to do things uh, that you wouldn't ordinarily have an opportunity to do and to make a difference uh, in, connection with your, uh, in connection with your profession. So those are basically some roundings, I guess. Mr. Letton, um, what are the chances of a third year law student being hired into your office? And if, <laughs> if I want to be a federal prosecutor, what are some tips or suggestions that I can make myself a more attractive candidate so that I can get into becoming a AUSA? Okay, well, I'm going to do what the judge didn't stand up simply because normally I'd, I'd like to do this informally, but I think there are guys over there that probably can't see us. Uh, big By the way, how many of our interns are here? Uh, USA, there you go. And uh, so we've got folks here in, in, our, in, in the office who, who work with us. Um, first of all, and, and I'm going to start off with the bad news. The bad news is it, it generally in a U.S. attorney's office, because you, on your first day in the job, you'll walk in, and Judge Happy remembers this, you'll walk into your job as an AUSA, and sitting on your desk is a, is a, is a stack of files. You will end up in front of a U.S. magistrate judge your first day on the job whether it's doing first appearances in migratory waterfowl cases or food stamp cases or whatever, you will be in the general crimes unit and you will be given a docket of criminal cases to work on the investigation, <coughs> to do grand jury practice, to do Rule 16 discovery and the whole thing. And so as a result of that, it is generally not our practice and not U.S. attorney's practices to hire someone directly out of law school. That said, um, we do employ uh, uh, law clerks, we do employ interns who get the, who cut your teeth with us, who do good research, who, who equip yourselves well as professionals, that we look at very favorably when you come back later after you've gotten some experience. First of all, one of the exceptions to hiring right out of law school is the, uh, the DOJ Honors Program. The DOJ Honors Program, by the way, my boss, the Attorney General of the United States, uh, and the Deputy Attorney General, Eric Holder and Jim Cole, both were career DOJ uh, folks, came up through the department in their careers, both started right out of law school as they left law school in the DOJ honors program. It's competitive, it's limited, very, very small number, but it's something worth angling for. Some U.S. attorney's offices, depending upon availability of slots, et cetera, will hire people through the honors program. Generally, the litigating components in D.C. do that. If, however, you're in a situation and your, your U.S. Attorney's Office doesn't have an honors program or you can't get into it, to make yourself more attractive to a U.S. Attorney's Office, and it depends, different U.S. Attorneys are looking for different things. I have a history of hiring people with litigation experience who have acquitted themselves very well as assistant, generally as assistant DAs in various uh, uh, offices throughout the country. We've hired people who've done, who've done a civil litigation and have gotten experience there two, three, four, five years, uh, and we've hired folks who have, who have been judicial law clerks, state and federal. That gives you the equivalent of litigation in that you see and are immersed in the inner workings of the, of the, the judiciary, the judicial process, and get to, get to experience a lot of litigation from a, from a very valuable perspective. So there, you know, again, litigation, judicial clerking, are things that are going to help to get you poised to enter a U.S. Attorney's Office. Because for the most part, unless you're hired as an appellate attorney, and we have very few of those, we're going to be looking for litigators. And that's sort of it in a nutshell. Speaking of appellate attorneys, yes. I'd like to turn over to the uh, Federal Defender Program. Um, Robert, can you talk a little bit about what the day is like for you with the Federal Defender Program? Well, <laughs> 
for me, it's pretty easy. I walk in, get behind my computer, do legal research, and write. So, but I think um, the importance of that for me, that's like being on vacation. I mean, I love doing that, and I'm sure there are some people in this room who don't want to be trial lawyers. I mean, it's very important to understand your personality. Maybe when you get out of law school, first off, you want to go to a state DA or a public defender and see, do you like being up in front of, um, on your feet all the time in a courtroom? Other people do like more reflective, uh, quieter atmosphere, and I'm one of those, and that's, um, I find as a federal defend defender, um, I have the time that I need to do a good job, I have the resources that I need, um, it's a very comfortable position to be in, so I would, you know, s say pretty early on, you've got to figure out which route do you want to go, appellate or trial, you know, whether you go into criminal law or not. Wayne, as a former prosecutor um, in Brooklyn, you were putting people that look just like you in jail. Can you talk about the criminal justice for letter work? <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about that and why you chose uh, prosecution? Um, you know, for me, it, it was a pretty easy decision. I think that quite often, when you're thinking about race in the criminal justice system, um, we always focus on the unfairness and the inequities when you're talking about African-American men in particular as, as defendants. Um, but what the system seems to forget is, is that it's the same population who are disproportionately um, victimized it's the same population when you're talking about the way you're treated as, uh, as a witness or you're uh, barred from sitting on juries, you know, et cetera. And understanding that and understanding the very, I think a prosecutor, when you look at defense attorneys and uh, judges and no disrespect uh, intended, they're probably the most potent actors in the system in this way. They've got the most amount of discretion with the least amount of oversight. And when it comes to playing that role in, in my community, when it comes to making those uh, um, hard decisions, when it comes to protecting my community and the rights of the defendant, when you merge all of those together, you know, I want to be the one sitting at the table making those um, hard decisions and protecting my community. So for me, it was, it was an easy choice. Jose, um, what type of discretion do the assistant district attorneys have in, in, in your office when they're looking at the, at the case and deciding whether or not they're going to go forward? Um, I think uh, you know, the discretion in our office increases with the time that you're in the office. I think, I think initially, when, uh, when you become a prosecutor in our office, um, you do not have, you certainly don't have total discretion, and your discretion is limited. It's, it's limited as to what type of plea offers uh, you, can, you, can, you can afford, uh, you can offer to the defendant. Um, it's, uh, it's your, your filing decisions are going to be, uh, are going to be subjected to scrutiny, and, uh, and that's just the truth of the matter. We, we put people in courtrooms who have been lawyers for about three days. Um, and, 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 and actually, in our jurisdiction, because of the student practice rule, when we hire our largest group of lawyers in the fall, the majority of the folks that we hired aren't even barred yet. They're waiting on their bar results. But under our Florida student practice rule, we can put you in court. So you're brand new lawyers, and you're making decisions that are going to significantly impact that defendant's life. Um, and that are significantly going to impact your vi the victims on the case. So your discretion is limited. Uh, as you as as you progress in the office, you, you're going to have more and more discretion. Uh, you know, to where you reach a point, at least with with a lot of the lawyers that I supervise, you know, it's really not. I mean, you know, they have to come to me for to make certain decisions on their cases, but I really see it more as a as a collaborative dialogue. They're going to come. We're going to talk about the cases. I'm going to share my thoughts with them. They're going to share their thoughts with me. And by and large, I'm going to defer to them as 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 the assistant that's got to stand up and, and process the case. So I think as a general rule, you're going to have limited discretion initially. 
and you're going to have more discretion as you go along. But that being said, um, when you get up in that courtroom and it's your case, and you will, at least in my office, you're going to be first seating jury trials, you know, within a couple of weeks of your being there. Um, when you get up in front of that jury and you're, you're doing voir dire, when you do your openings or your direct or your cross-examinations, or when you're doing your summations, there's no one there pulling you by the back of your skirt, by the back of your pants, saying, hey, don't do this, yes, do this. You, you know, you're, you're going to have the discretion to present your case to that jury. And uh, so, you know, even though there's going to be limitations on plea offers and on filing decisions, you know, don't forget that when you get up, it's, it's you. Um, it's all you, and you know, when the judge, you know, puts his glasses down and says, and says you know, Mr. Rubble, approach, and you know it's not going to be really, really pretty, and it's you. So, I mean, you know, so in some respects, you know, there's a, there's a limited amount of discretion, but in other respects, you know, once you get up, well, you know, once, once that veneer walks into the courtroom, you're going to have infinite amounts of discretion. So it's, it's, it's kind of weighted both ways. That's kind of the way I like to look at it. Robin and Amanda, um, Eric Holder filled a question talking about uh, basically the lack of resources that a lot of the public defenders' offices, local as well as federal, are facing. Um, I was wondering if you guys can talk about some of the challenges uh, that the offices are facing. Can I say first, I want to say a few words about prosecutorial discretion. <laughs> 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 um, one of the things you learn about federal law is that in some ways the prosecutor is one of the most powerful people in the courtroom because they get, you have statutes that have mandatory minimum sentences attached to them and the prosecutor gets to decide whether or not to charge under that statute. And one of the responsibilities that you're going to have if you choose to become a prosecutor is to use that power in a judicious way, both not to punish people just because they're stubborn and don't want to plead guilty, um, and not to punish people because they, ex at least defense perspective, because they exercise their, choose to exercise, for example, their Fourth Amendment rights and go to trial. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting anything about your office, Jim, because I see you <laughs> looking at me like you want. I'm but it's very, you, yeah. it's very, um, <laughs> When you're a young prosecutor, that's a lot of power to have. And you've got to learn to use restraint and um, exercise it wisely. In terms of resources, the biggest problem our office has is we can't fill vacancies. So now we have one secretary for the entire office. And some of us work seven days a week. Um, and I'm trying to think. Now we have to be careful to print on both sides of the paper. We still have enough yellow pads. <laughs> We've canceled, for example, this really hurts me, we used to get the criminal law reporter, which is really important in terms of keeping abreast of the law. We can't afford that anymore. So, um, yeah, the cuts have made a pretty big difference. I think um, from the state side, Maryland Office of the Public Defenders is, is hurting very, very much right now. Um, I know within the appellate division, we have about 25 attorneys. Um, we have one working printer right now. We can't afford to replace the, the computer, so a lot of us are bringing our own laptops to work. Um, and so as far as the, the funding is concerned, I think there's a difference, I think, with, with the, the, you know, the state offices compared to the, to the federal offices. Um, the other thing that we've dealt with recently are our furloughs. So um, having to take a forced, aid, forced um, vacation, but um, mm -hmm. You, you still have that, that same amount for, in, in my case, of briefs due at the end of the month. So um, we're, we're, we're not in a good place uh, financially. Um, that said, I work with, I think, the most amazing, um, talented and compassionate attorneys. Um, and, and that's really what makes my, my day every day, because it's, it's not the resources. And uh, let me jump in on that, too. As, a, as I'm a career prosecutor, you know, and, and I will tell you that the public defender's offices, and Robin, of course, is a federal public defender. Amanda has been a, you've been a state public defender. Yes. And, and um, the public defender's offices are, to say that they're essential to the criminal justice system and that, that their funding and staffing 
is essential to the criminal justice system is probably the greatest understatement in the world. You know, maybe politically or whatever, they're not as attractive to shove money towards or whatever because, you know, people don't see them as being essential to enforcement. But the criminal justice system breaks down, bogs down, if you have an understaffed, uh, underfunded public defender's office. After Katrina, when Newell Norman, uh, judge, one of the most powerful sheriffs here in town, we had a, I put together a, a, a consortium of, of, of all the local law enforcement people here together with the, fund, the funding people from DOJ, from the various funding mechanisms, OJP, BJA, NI, NIJ, et cetera. And the first person to stand up and say, we need funding because the, the criminal justice system here was shut down. He said, we need, Newell Norman stood up and said, the first thing we need is a robust, well-staffed, well-funded public defender's office in, in each parish. Uh, and if we miss that, we will bog down the entire criminal justice system. We've seen some of that rear its head in New Orleans, and that's why the U.S. Department of Justice, for the first time ever a few years ago, through uh, uh, OJP, actually sent money to support the public defender's office. Uh, so the point is that, you know, we, yeah, we, we, we push prosecution and, and being prosecutors as a, as a great avenue uh, to get trial experience. Public defender's offices are not only an essential part of the criminal justice system, uh, but every bit is essential as, uh, as a U.S. Attorney's Office, as a DA's office, and, and provides experience to litigators, whether prosecutor or whatever, every bit is important and rich and essential as, 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 uh, as those who are on the prosecution. Judge Afric, uh, I was hoping that you might be able to speak to um, maybe some law students or young lawyers for that matter that are thinking, I, I want to open up my own practice. I want to go out and <coughs> start my own firm, do things my way. So you don't like to eat is what you're telling me. <laughs> <laughs> is that a good route to go or <coughs> maybe starting out in a public defender's office or state attorney's office to get some experience? You know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure I'm the best one to ask that question, to be honest with you, because I, I've never been in solo practice. Uh, because you have working for a firm or with, you know, some other individuals, you have some support as far as coverage and other things that you wouldn't have otherwise. Oh, by the way, there, how many of you are interested in maybe a career in the criminal area, either on the defense side of the prosecution? Would you raise your hand? Oh, quite a few of them. Wow. Quite a few of them. That's great. Well, let me, let me just say this for me personally. <coughs> The proof of the pudding, the one I'm about to tell you is the fact that most of the judges on our court <coughs> come from the civil background, you know, the plaintiff or the defense side, <coughs> the large firms are, you know, doing plaintiff's, plaintiff's work. Not many of them have had the, uh, come from the criminal side. But I will tell you this, the judges who were worried when they came in about handling the criminal matters, once they got adjusted and learned about sentencing guidelines and mandatory minimums and 404B and some other rules of evidence and things like that, they would rather now try criminal cases than civil cases. And not that things like sentencing is <coughs> not an enjoyable thing, but they would rather do that than, than what they do on the civil side. Uh, after, <coughs> I, I clerked for an appellate court judge for a year after law school, and then uh, I engaged in some civil work before I went to the DA's office. And I can tell you, I understand Tulane's expensive. I mean, when I went to Carolina, it was like $220 a semester, okay? It's sort of hard to beat, right? Hard to beat. No loans, no loans. Just to beat that at $220 a semester. I know, what, I know what Tulane is. And I understand there are loans to pay back because, quite frankly, I hire clerks from all over the country, Tulane, Northeastern schools, and I know that I had one clerk who's now in the DOJ honors program, as a matter of fact, who left Princeton with uh, who left Princeton, <coughs> Princeton with loans, and then he went to Harvard. He left Harvard with loans, so he had about three hundred thousand dollars of loans getting out. Okay, he's going to DOJ honors, but he may have to get lost from after that. No number close to go to work for some of these large firms to be able to pay it off, and then they come back and do what they really want to do. You know, whether it be U.S. Attorney's Office, public defenders, whatever. But I will tell you this: when I was in civil practice, you know, my dad used to always tell me. He said, you know, you have to want to tie your shoes to go to work in the morning. Now, this is just me. I'm not speaking to you. But, but I can tell you that <coughs> moving money around, writing reports, taking depositions, okay, waiting who, know, who knows how many years to go ahead and actually try the case, <coughs> all right, that was not going to work for me. When I get uh, young people like yourselves and 
come in front of me and have a conference or something in my chambers. They say, well, I'm in the litigation section of such and such firm, whatever it is. And then I'll speak to them after, have you tried any cases? No, I haven't tried any cases yet. You know, I'm looking to second share a case with somebody. I'm looking to take a deposition. I mean, honestly, what are you doing? The brightest of the bright, these young people I get from, you know, spend a year in New York or Chicago for them, and they'll come down and work for me for, for a year or so. I mean, what they're doing is document reviews with these biggest firms. That's basically what they're doing. Not that I criticize that, and they're making a nice living because they're working their asses off, too. Okay, six days a week, sometimes more than that. But it's just what you want. I didn't get anything from billing hours and, and, uh, and doing that sort of thing. I mean, I was miserable, you know? So I found a place uh, uh, by, by chance at the DA's office down here. Because I enjoyed it over there, I worked with people like Jim Letton, you know, a colleague of mine so much respect for, and it was like a fraternity. We were young guys, so like interns in a hospital, and we're, you know, trying cases, and we have some discretion, and we, you know, we're trying to do things right, and, and uh, uh, you know, providing a public service, which we think we are. So, I mean, it was terrific. And then the U.S. Attorney's Office opened up, and they called me, and I was over there for a while. I just loved it. Maybe the best job that I've ever had, quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned. So, this, this law thing is such a demanding profession that, if money is, is a real issue, you have a handicapped child, you have parents, you have to support whatever, everybody understands that. But I'm telling you, this, is a, this, this criminal stuff is a great gig. You're going to love what you're doing. You're going to be, early on, you're going to be doing something which is meaningful. You know, you go to a place like the Federal Public Defender, U.S. Attorney's Office, they make a very nice living. I mean, the only reason they can't go up now is because we hadn't had a raise in 22 years. <laughs> We're pulling for you, too. Yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> we pull for each other here. But that's the truth. But you know what? Guys in Jim's office make, what, 140, maybe more a year, huh? Cap here, actually, the, the cap uh, with locality pay right here is 155000 right now. That's, now. that's what I'm making. People who are the top of my office are below that by a couple of hundred bucks. So it's, it's not bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Plus the other benefits you have. Doesn't feel like a lot, but it's, it's okay. <laughs> don't interrupt. <laughs> plus, plus the fact that you have a life to do things other than just be in the office. Now, if you have a trial, you may be there Saturday, Sunday. But if you have a family, you like coaching soccer, you want to take a trip or something. It's not the end of the world. You can do it. You can do it. And and it's interesting because you know what. If you like dealing with characters, okay? If you like standing on your two feet and having to use your wits. If you like not having to file motions for summary judgments or motions to compel, okay? And dealing with adjusters. I mean, it's a, it's a great thing. So, quite frankly, anybody who wants to go that route can afford to do it. I just think it's a terrific avenue of, of practice. Now, you heard how, I know it's very difficult to get on at the U.S. Attorney's Office, Public Defender's Office, I understand that. It's very difficult to get these clerkships, quite frankly. About 700 of us in the country, and I must get 300 really good applications every time I have an opening. So, cause then I, so, that's, so that's very, very tough. But you know what? You just got to keep your eye on the ball. If you know where you're going, you need to keep your eye on the ball, find a way to get there, whether it be through the DA's office, whether it be through doing defense work, whatever. Uh, you know, you can go ahead if you, if you, if you're that, focused on it, you can get it done. And uh, like I say, it's like having the whole meal as opposed to just the appetizer. So I certainly commend, commend to each of you should you decide to do that. Wayne, could you talk about um, your bar activities and how they may or may not have helped you with your career? Um, sure. Uh, and I think being involved uh, with the with the bar, it's it's a tremendous benefit, um, and I'm not just even talking about just the the ABA. Um, I'm actually a past president of the National Black Prosecutors Association, and whether it's here in New Orleans, um, <coughs> whether I go to Arizona, quite frankly, when I go to um, to the UK, I know prosecutors literally all across this this country. And, and internationally. Um, my involvement with the criminal justice section, uh, I, again, about three, three years ago maybe, um, the current chair, of, I mean the chair of the, the section at that time, says, um, you know, Wayne, what do you know about prosecuting art cases? I'm like, well, why are you asking? We're going to do a program in Bilbao, Spain. 
um, where we're going to teach them about prosecuting art cases. He says, well, I've been a prosecutor for 15 years. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> I'd never prosecuted an art that case in my life, but had the opportunity to travel uh, to, to Spain. And we did actually did a pretty good job, had uh, an absolutely great time. Through the bar association, it can be something as simple as, um, as networking. If I hear about someone who says to me, well, they're looking for a job in Miami, I can now pick up a phone and call on a first name basis um, someone there. I've had some really incredible mentors that quite frankly I've gotten through my affiliation with the Bar Association. And then on the flip side, you've got an opportunity to do some great work. Two of the things that my committee um, is involved in. Number one, we developed a cultural competency curriculum aimed at prosecutors, judges, and defense attorneys. And I'm not talking about cultural sensitivity, let's sit down in a room and sing kumbaya. I'm talking about developing a real curriculum um, that, that's extremely helpful and has been extremely well received. The other thing we're actively involved in, and New Orleans is one of our pilot sites, um, we got a grant to use four jurisdictions as pilots for a racial justice task force right where we're bringing together all of the system actors um, to pick out various issues and really to collectively <coughs> um, try to solve these issues. All of this work um, I've been exposed to through, through the Bar Association and I can probably stand up here for another 40 minutes <laughs> and, and just talk about this, so many positive ways, not only what you can get out of it, but the opportunities to contribute. One of the, I think really the greatest resource about the ABA criminal justice section, um, we put out papers, we talk about Supreme Court cases, there's a lot of information that you can get on the web, but really our greatest <coughs> asset is our members. Um, they're a great resource and they're always willing to, to try to talk with uh, not just law students, but young lawyers, other practitioners. It's really that debate that makes us all better uh, practitioners. Um, so to that end, the goal is to not just talk at you, but also to talk with you. So we're going to try to open it up to some questions, but I also wanted to recognize uh, Eric Barron, who's also a criminal justice section member. Eric, could you just stand up for a moment? And could you just tell them a little bit about your background briefly? Um, he's from Maryland. He's the chair of our young lawyers section for the uh, Maryland State Bar. But could you also talk about your activities in the bar, what you do, what your background is a little bit. Um, right now I'm a solo practitioner in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Uh, before that I was on the President's Transition Team and the Justice of the Civil Rights Review Team. Uh, I worked for the Vice President in the United States uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, before that I was a Federal Prosecutor of Maine Justice in the Criminal Division. I was a State prosecutor in Baltimore uh, uh, with Sydney, um, and uh, you know, it's a little bit about my career. I've had a, a lot of great jobs in the criminal justice area. Um, I'm very involved in the ABA, the state bar association, the local bar associations. Um, those, the people that I've met through the bar, have been res at least partly responsible for some of the great jobs that I've gotten. Um, and then now, as a solo practitioner. You know, all the judges I've had beers with through the Bar Association, I get to appear before them, and you know, there's nothing like appearing before a judge that you shared a beer with. <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, there's some, some little benefits that you might not necessarily think about, but you meet great people, uh, great friends, and, uh, you know, like Wayne was saying, you know, I can now call people at, you know, any state you can think of and, and get help, get an answer. Um, on a first name basis. So it's it's just an excellent way to supplement not just your career but your personal life, your if you want to give back, um, 
you know, these local and, and state bar associations, the ABA, they have a tremendous influence on uh, criminal justice policy nationwide. Um, when I was in uh, council in the United States Senate, um, we listened to what the ABA had to say on these issues. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very uh, involved in the state legislature and the state bar association, the same thing. When they speak on something, these uh, policymakers listen. Um, so, I mean, I can go on and on and on myself, um, but you know, I'm willing to talk to anybody on an individual basis. I would say take advantage of these, these folks you have sitting here, get their cards, follow up with them. Um, it's, it's rough out there right now. So, you, you know, you may not be able to step into the U.S. Attorney's Office right now, but the, the things that you do right now will get you in that office years down the road. Uh, when I was in law school, my third year, I interned at the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Appellate Division in D.C. Those people are still getting phone calls about me. There's, there, there's still references. Even when I don't list them as a reference, <laughs> that office is it on my resume, and people call that office and talk to my, my supervisors. So the, everything that you're doing now, there's going to be a ripple effect for years to come. So just think about that. Yeah, I just want to say just two things very, very quickly. First off, just to dovetail on what Eric said, um, and, and uh, I'm not suggesting to you that, that a judge is going to rule with you because he knows you, because if you believe that, you're in for a root awakening. But, um, you know, I mean, I entered in the Northern District of Florida when I was in law school, and the U.S. Attorney at the time um, is now a sitting district court judge in the Southern District where I practice. And there is some benefit you know, to, you know, when you walk into court in the sitting district court judge when I was in private practice is someone who I clerked for, who I interned with um, when I was in law school. If, if for nothing else, you know, you look up and, you know, there's, there's at least the, the small, almost crack of a smile, you know, and, you know, there is a certain degree of comfort to that, that, you know, that the, that the sitting district court judge is someone who you work for at some point and who knows about it. And, and then also, you know, don't get the feeling that working with, that working with voluntary bar associations is something esoteric that's never going to have an impact on your practice. And I can just give you, just in my jurisdiction in Florida, over the last five years, you know, through, through our voluntary bar associations, both the Florida Bar and the ABA, you know, we've tackled issues, you know, as, you know, as concrete as, you know, the order of closing arguments in state court prosecutions in Florida. Who goes first, who goes second, who gets sandwiched. Um, you know, whether, whether judges are going to have the discretion to waive minimum mandatory sentences in our state, um, you know, when judges can deviate, you know, from minimum, you know, from the sentencing guidelines in our state, you know, uh, whether prosecutors have to consider collateral consequences of a conviction in making plea offers, um, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And if you're not involved in these voluntary associations who are going to afford advice to the Supreme Court in, in a state jurisdiction, you know, you're going to have these rules, you know, you're going to be impacted on them. So if you're not involved in the ground floor, you're, they, you're going to have to deal with the rules anyway. So if you have an interest in it and it affects your practice, there's no better way to get it on the ground floor on these discussions. And a lot of them going on right now in our jurisdiction and in nationally. You know, a public defender workload litigation and whether, you know, there, there's a constitutional or an ethical bar for a public defender to advocate on behalf of an individual defendant given her or her caseload. That's being litigated in our jurisdiction right now, and it's a national issue. So, you know, it's not, you know, it's something that's going to have a practical effect on what you do day in and day out, both as a prosecutor and as a defender. So there is that benefit to get them on the ground floor, ground floor and, you know, you know, be heard and try to shape policy, you know, before you walk into the court when they go, oh, by the way, you know, you. You know, you're, you're, you're the prosecutor, but you're going to get sandwiched in the middle of an opening close and a close close by the defendant in this jurisdiction. So, you know, it, it, it has a practical effect. So it's, it's not just fine the sky stuff. But, by the way, don't smile if you're in front of me or expect to smile, because I'm going to be smiling at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not here as Judge Moore. <laughs> Do we have any questions? This. I have a question about choosing which path you go into for criminal law. Is it? I frowned upon if you start with defense and then eventually change to prosecution. I think Judy would like to. <laughs> I'm just going to answer that. Um, I've been with the Department of Justice for 40 years this year. And I have 
and never had any interest in appearing before a judge or litigating a case. Um, my father was a judge, so I knew that if someone yelled at me, it, I would start crying. <laughs> so, I, I just couldn't do it. Um, and my interest was never in the practice of law. Um, I had a master's in correctional administration. So I went into law to do things that I was interested in that had nothing to do with being, I ended up being, a pro, I'm in the criminal division and I'm a prosecutor um, in the department, but I would recommend to you, because frankly, the law jobs aren't out there and the, the prosecution and defense things that you're dreaming about might not be there this minute. But think about other things. Think about probation. Think about criminal justice issues that you're interested in. I ended up training wardens and sheriffs for five years on how to run a constitutional jail or prison. Fabulous job. Had nothing to do with what you usually think of as the role uh, of, a, of a criminal lawyer. It was great. Then, once you're in the field, you can maneuver anywhere you want. Prosecutors think that having a defense background is, is terrific. I mean, there's nobody better to get in your office if you're a prosecutor than a seasoned defense attorney, someone who understands the criminal justice system, and it works both ways. But if you're interested in something that's not prosecution or defense, like I was, I happen to be interested in juvenile justice, I worked, my internship was as a juvenile probation officer. That's how I got into the Justice Department in the Office of Juvenile Justice. But once you're in an office, or you're in criminal law or criminal justice, you can move around, and it's really great on your resume to show that you have more experience in some very narrow area of criminal justice. So think more broadly. Think about your personal interests that relate to criminal law, but it doesn't have to be prosecution or defense. Thanks. Thank you. Um, besides joining the ADA, are there any recommendations that you would make to us to best prepare us for a career in criminal justice? as far as classes go and activities that we can do in law school? Can I, yeah, I mean, I hear intern, yeah. Um, first of all, you know, I tell people, I tell young people this all the time. Uh, you know, when you, you know, you're, first of all, you're getting into a, a, the most competitive, in the most competitive legal environment that I've ever seen. You know, when I, when I graduated from law school in 79, the streets were paved with gold. There was, no, literally, there was work for everyone. Uh, people were hanging up their shingles and they were making money. The, 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 the Eastern District, the Fifth Circuit, was, was awash in Jones Act litigation, stuff like that. It was, you know, it's very tight out there. The economy's rough. Uh, and so, you know, and, and, and if you want to become competitive beyond law review and order of the coif and that sort of thing, one of the things I think you can do is uh, get, seek out internships, seek out clerk jobs and get establish yourself first of all hone your skills your practical skills develop those and it's going to go in your resume too because we're going to what happens is at some point I look at resumes I don't quite frankly I don't care about your grades I was you know I was not a standout student and I, I but I look for people who can be who are a good judgment sound sound uh, uh, good ethical values and, and good litigation skills um, law clinics Get practical experience in law clinics, and it doesn't matter, you know, if it's, you know, if it's, if it's, if you're doing criminal defense or prosecute, or, or it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Or if you're in the environmental clinic or whatever, get practical experience in the law clinics. Uh, you know, if uh, I know uh, Tulane's got a great, a great criminal law clinic. I think Loyola's got a great. So many of the law <coughs> do. Um, in, in, immerse yourself if you think you want to litigate in the moot court competition. Go beyond the, 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 the mandatory moot court when you're, when you're a, a 1L. Uh, any practical experience you can get uh, is going to help set you apart. It's going to help get you the, the, I think, give you skills that will then offset a little bit, to some extent, the fact that you're not going to have a track record when you, have that, when you get that JD and you get out there with only your grades, only your diploma, and only your resume and a very tight job. I was just going to stress the importance of, of um, the trial advocacy classes. 
I think, um, and, and beyond, even if you're not on the Moot Court board, there are a number of other competitions where you can, you can enter a team from your school. All of those things, I think, really help. The other thing I would say is watch seasoned attorneys. Um, as a new PD, when I had the time, um, I would sit in the back of the courtroom, and, you, and you're, you're going to know the litigators that, that, that have um, great reputations. And I think that to, to watch them and, and learn is, is one of the best things that you can do also. That's, if I, that's a great point. And, and I, when I was a young man right out of law school in the DA's office, I used to go watch the guys that I, that were, and, and gals that I thought were, were legendary, were the finest trial attorneys. And the, the one who I probably watched most was Judge Afric. And I, I said, no, that's true. <laughs> no, I, was, no I, I watched it. He was, he was the head of the Career Criminal Bureau and tried very difficult homicides, very, very difficult cases. Uh, along with a, with a person I love a great deal who works for me, Fred Harper, you know, they were an incredible team. I'd sit in court whenever I could, instead of running off and having a beer or whatever, I'd watch them. Uh, and so you can prepare yourself again by, by, by immersing yourself in, again, uh, the, the, this watching great litigators do what they do. You know what, as a follow-up to what, uh, what Jim just said, uh, one of the things I did is I knew I was sort of interested in the, uh, in the, federal, in the, in the criminal law area, I really wanted to be an FBI agent, but back then there was no such thing as LASIK, so, so I couldn't pass the vision test. It was what it was, okay? But uh, uh, one of the things I did is I volunteered. I didn't even get paid at the local DA's office. I knew I wasn't going to stay stay there, but I, but I did that. You know, Tulane has an externship, an internship program. I hired uh, two, as a judge, though, I have two networks <coughs> every, every year to work with you throughout the year. Of course, you get credit for it. Tulane gets paid for it, okay? And you uh, and you help and you help us, and also I hire some externs over the summer, and you know they immerse themselves in what we're doing, both in court and out of court. So you just got to sort of be outside the box sometimes and think about what you can do, not only to add to your resume, but to sort of uh, you know get some experience under your belt. But those are some great suggestions that you just heard. Well, listen, I'm sure there's some more questions, and again, this is a topic and an area that we could spend a lot of time about. But as promised. We have uh, pizza and some drinks, and so hopefully we can get the, our panelists to stick around for a couple of minutes. I know um, Mr. Lett is on a tight schedule, but we'd like um, everybody to go to the, um, the little reception room and continue the conversation there. So we can just thank our panelists.